Depending on where you are joining us uh, this morning, uh, good afternoon, good morning to those in the UK and good evening to those in the Far East. And welcome to our IBA Digital Talk Series as part of our IBA Hello China campaign. I'm Aslina Bulma, Director of International at our IBA. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to be joined this morning uh, by Professor Yuan Dean and Guangqi, Chair, Professor of Architecture School of Design of Shanghai Jiang Tong University, who will give us a talk today. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Before I introduce Professor Yuan, a few housekeeping rules, please. To ensure smooth running of the event. Can I ask all of you to turn off your camera and mic, apart from Professor Wan, of course. There will be opportunities for you to ask questions at the end. And if you have any, please raise your hands and I will call your name for you to then turn on your mic and camera to ask the question. The latter is optional. You, optional. you do not need to turn your camera if you don't wish to do so, of course. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Throughout the session today, feel free to use the chat function. Now, our IBA Hello China program of talk showcases the best of contemporary, established and emerging voices in architecture in China. And we are thrilled to be streaming Professor Yuan from uh, direct from Shanghai for this talk. Whilst all of us are based across the world, some of us at home like myself and others in the office perhaps today. We are also really pleased that with many connections have been forged over the last difficult uh, year, this difficult year, um, particularly in China and surrounding area since the opening of our offices in Shanghai in December 2019. Uh, we also opened an office in UAE during the same time and it has really enhanced the global connection of our idea community, enabling exchanges no matter where we are in the world. This increasingly vibrant global connection has been integral in keeping us all together as a global community, despite the global challenges we are all facing. So today, if you would like to tell us where you are listening from, please do tell us now in the chat box. It's great to hear where you're listening from to continue this global connection. We are having to launch a Hello China campaign earlier in summer where we are still delivering a series of events and thought leadership activities such as the one today throughout China. Keep a tab on our Chinese website for more information, which is www.rib.org.cn. And also for those in China and uh, have access to WeChat, RIB WeChat account. Uh, the ID is simply RIB China. Uh, for those outside China, you can also access all this information the main website, which is architecture.com, uh, for further information. Now, moving on to our very eminent speaker for today, um, Zing Ran, PhD, is a founding dean and Guangqi Chair Professor of Architecture of School of Design, Shanghai Jiang Tong University. He's a member of Shanghai Jiang Tong University Academic Committee, and he was a director of architecture, chair of architecture discipline, and Director of Masters of Architecture. Prior to his appointment to UNSW, he was Head of School of Architecture at the University of Technology in Sydney. In 2019, he was the Curator of Shanghai Urban Space Art Season Biennale. And Xing has published um, on a cultural history of housing architecture and anthropology, vernacular architecture, ar architecture education, Louise Kahn and modern architecture. China pre-modern, modern and contemporary architecture, as well as Australian contemporary architecture. I think you all agree to me, he is rather impressive. His books have received critical acclaim and enthusiastic appraisal, both in academic journals and from some mainstream media too, from around the world. I'm very much looking forward uh, to the talk this morning. So I'm going to be handing you over to Professor Wan to begin and we'll come back uh, to chair the Q&A. Please, before I do so, can I remind the audience to keep your mic and camera off during his talk. Over to you, Zing. Thank you very much, uh, Aslina. Uh, is my voice clear uh, from your end? All right. Yes, very um, clear. Yeah, very clear. 
OK, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for your generous introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Aslina and the IBA for this invitation. I'm, uh, I'm very delighted to have this opportunity to share this talk with all of you. And uh, so good morning, good evening, and good day. And uh, um, now uh, let me spend a few minutes before this uh, long story, which, we'll, which I will tell briefly. Uh, let me spend a few minutes to explain the background and uh, what's behind uh, this, uh, this theme or this, this topic. And uh, I think when RIBA launched um, the China series, and uh, it was just before COVID-19. And uh, I remember when I was doing this uh, uh, testing run with Aslina yesterday, and we were talking about that. Um, now, so much has happened, and uh, we all know the world has changed. And uh, it seems to me um, at this extraordinary time in history, in human history. And uh, um, we are beginning to see um, some really fascinating geopolitics. Um, but uh, people to people level communications are continuing regardless. So it seems to me this RIBA China talk series has become timely again. The reason I say that is, is that I think uh, the whole business of understanding, and uh, if I use a, a gross generalization, uh, understanding between West and the East, and between China and the rest of the world, uh, is becoming even more important and, and relevant. I, I think this is a a general background of, of today's talk. Now, um, I'm going to, in this talk, um, make some, uh, I'm going to ask some very big questions, and uh, I'm going to uh, also make some vast claims. And, um, but worry not, I will use some specific examples, including a, a building project that I'm working on. Um, to illustrate. In, in fact, my purpose for today's talk is not so much about architecture. I would like to use architecture as, as a vehicle uh, to talk about uh, cross-culture exchange and uh, common ground, similarities and differences. And uh, I think I will come back in my concluding remarks to um, to reflect on uh, how much common ground do we share and uh, what kind of differences can we uh, identify and, uh, and put them in good use. I think that's the purpose of, of today's talk. Now, uh, also, I think part of today's talk, and uh, as I said, it's a long story. I'm going to tell the story in a brief, in a brief way. And, um, but uh, fortunately, part of this long story, particularly the Chinese courtyard part, um, is going to be uh, more elaborated on in a book, which I hope will be uh, released next year, uh, accidentally, incidentally, um, in the UK um, by the Bloomsbury. So hopefully in the second half of the year and the book in, in the English speaking world will be, will be published. So if I make some gross generalization in today's talk, and I hope the book will make up the shortfall um, uh, for today's talk. And All right, OK, uh, let me begin. Uh, Vitruvius Courtyard, Confucius Courtyard, and a developing story. And uh, uh, Vitruvius is probably 500, 500 years younger than, than Confucius. Uh, but let me let me talk about the courtyard first. Um, what what exactly is a is a courtyard? I, I think a courtyard in in English connotation 
somehow is a, is an alien uh, concept, and like many architecture concepts in the English language, uh, such as corridor, uh, imported imported word, uh, because courtyard as a specific way of uh, building or dwelling uh, is not necessarily an English thing. And, um, uh, but interestingly, uh, many other cultures, a um, uh, long, long time ago, uh, for example, uh, the Mediterranean world, the, the, the antiquity, um, and, uh, and the Chinese uh, share this common way of uh, building buildings and, uh, and uh, uh, dwelling uh, on Earth. Uh, but before I go into that, and uh, um, let's just switch back to the modern mindset to look at some strange things about uh, what we call what we call a, a courtyard. A courtyard, um, to simplify, uh, when we build, we build on the periphery, on a block of land. Uh, instead, we could build in the middle of a block of land. So if you look at these two diagrams, uh, the one on the left, you build on the periphery, and then you create uh, a void in the middle that opens to sky, and that's a courtyard. And uh, uh, what is on the right is, is uh, something that we're familiar. It's like a, a, a suburban house uh, in, in the UK or in many other countries. And uh, uh, you, you build a building in the middle of the land. But the interesting thing, if we use the modern mindset, is to see uh, the economy of land use and uh, to build on the periphery and uh, you create more open space. And uh, uh, it's more efficient and you, you create the same floor area. But uh, the building on the right, you, you use more you use more floor space and you have less uh, open space around the building. That's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, 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 result of, uh, of uh, uh, land use. Now, let me use another example to illustrate that further. Uh, some years ago, uh, Leslie Martin and his colleagues at Cambridge uh, that was the fa famous research group on land economy. So they did some research, and uh, I, I think the fundings of their research uh, agrees with this uh, ancient wisdom in terms of the um, land economy and the most uh, efficient way of, of building. And uh, uh, According to them, there are approximately three ways of the building, and you can build a building uh, like a pavilion. So it's a building object in the middle of a block of land. Uh, the second one in the middle, you, you build slabs. And the third one, you build courts. So you occupy the periphery, and then you have them uh, uh, connected, and they form a kind of a fabric, a matrix of courts. And the fascinating result of that is that when they took uh, a, a, a piece of uh, uh, middle Manhattan and uh, uh, to use Miss Vendoro's building, Seagram building, 38 stories, as a, as a benchmark. Now, in order to reach the kind of, uh, uh, in architecture terms, plot ratio, you know, space floor ratio. And uh, if you turn the pavilions, buildings as objects in the middle of the land into uh, the courtyards, uh, a matrix of, of courts, and uh, you could do uh, all, the, all these 38 story towers and you could achieve the same floor area and more open space with an average eight story building. And that's, that's interesting. Now, if it's such an efficient way of using land, why did building, uh, why, why, why did people make New York a forest of towers, objects uh, in the city? 
and why we uh, make uh, Pudong in Shanghai uh, similar as, uh, as that in Manhattan. And uh, even London, London was a flat city. London is still a flat city. And I think uh, the Danish architecture historian Rasmussen wrote a beautiful uh, uh, book on Lon London. London, a unique city is the title of the book. It's almost a love letter to London. And he praised London as a flat city. And he worried if London went up and uh, the quality of the English life would be lost. Uh, but now London is going up. You also have a CBD, you also have high rise buildings. So when you look at that land economy and uh, you wonder why um, uh, people are not building courtyards anymore. But OK, so this is a modern thinking, a modern way of, of, uh, of looking at things and the economy efficiency are the primary concerns. Uh, but our ancestors perhaps did not think that way, not that they did not understand the mathematics of it. It was more a uh, divine geometry, and in the Chinese way, it's celestial. And I will return to that. But le let us leave this uh, fascinating uh, 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 result of land economy aside. Let's look into uh, how uh, our ancestors um, managed to actually build and live in such a specific way, which seems to be quite alien to many of us in the world. So courtyard, uh, it seems to me still is an enigma. It's a mystery. Uh, but, you know, humans did not actually start building courtyard. They start building individual buildings, uh, subterranean hearts in China, subterranean hearts in many other countries. So the Greeks and Romans built courtyards, and uh, of course the Romans admired the Greeks, and uh, uh, Vitruvius wrote about courtyards, and uh, but he very much used Greek examples. If we look at uh, this example, and uh, it, it's a, a reconstruction of a courtyard building in uh, 2nd BC. And uh, we can see this almost a universal configuration, but, uh, you know, the, the, the rooms around it are the rooms uh, of different kind of uh, activities. It's not so much a kind of uh, mindset as we understand it today we would uh, we would organize a house based on the different uses and they all seems to be used as uh, some sort of uh, a lounge room or sitting room so the famous greek symposium you know people would leisurely uh, 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 recline on the couch and have a have a leisurely conversation so the whole meaning of symposium is is to recline on the couch and have a conversation one by one. Yeah. Uh, but the, the centerpiece of the building of the courtyard, of course, is the room that opens to sky. Yeah. Um, now, I will return to this particular room later. What, what actually what actually happens in that room, that court that opens to sky? And uh, many activities are uh, ceremonial and, uh, and the religious activities, you know, uh, uh, ancestors worship and uh, weddings and funerals uh, or things that celebrate seasonal change, etc. And uh, uh, so it is really a kind of vertical relationship, heaven and earth relationship. And even multi-story building. Uh, in, in Rome, the so-called insula, and uh, they were built like courtyards. But only the poor uh, live in those multi-story buildings, up to 10 stories. And uh, the only difference is that the social hierarchy is reversed. The poor uh, live on the top of the building with a view. Now today, because of the invention of the lift, so the rich live in, in 
in the penthouse with a view. So it's completely reversed. Yeah. Now, let me spend a few minutes to uh, focus on the Roman courtyard. And, uh, and then uh, uh, let me also um, uh, remind you of uh, Vitruvius interpretation of the meaning of a Roman courtyard. So uh, a Roman courtyard, if we use, the, if we use uh, this example from Pompeii, yeah, uh, much has been preserved uh, from the antiquity, from this Roman colony, um, as we know, because of this tragedy. Yeah, the city perished um, um, after Vesuvius erupted. Um, now, if we if we look at uh, this Roman domus, and uh, the first courtyard called Atrium that opens to the street, and then the second courtyard called Peristyle is connected to the first uh, a courtyard Atrium, and then there, there is again there's a there's a backyard. So you look at this section, you can see uh, the uh, Atrium, the first courtyard is actually a rather narrow one. So atrium, again, in the English uh, connotation, and uh, it is not a um, glossy, uh, multi-volume space in uh, a posh hotel or in a suburban shopping mall. It's actually a very dark uh, auditor room, and uh, it's vertical. It's a heaven and earth relationship. Uh, verticality, verticality is paramount. So if we look at this uh, 19th century reconstruction, and, uh, and you can see that. But Vitruvius did not talk about this relationship. And instead, he emphasized the public nature of the courtyard. And he talks about uh, the atrium and uh, those ones who um, occupy high positions, a magistrate or a lawyer. And uh, they ought to make this room a ornate room. Uh, the regal nature of this room is very important because according to Vitruvius, anyone without an invitation can walk into the atrium and the Paris star because this is the extension of the street. This is the extension of the civic space. And uh, um, so uh, in the morning and uh, um, the poor and the ordinary citizens and uh, would spend the time in the atrium waiting for their turn to get an audience from those uh, who are in power. Yeah. Um, it is probably a very uh, puzzling kind of uh, idea um, because it's impossible for us to even uh, imagine that, you know, those who occupy high positions or uh, a Hollywood movie star would open their splendid uh, living room or lobby uh, to an uh, ordinary citizen uh, on the street. Yeah. Um, and the life in the peristyle, uh, the second courtyard, uh, is more a leisure one. So the, the, the Romans uh, admired this the so-called ocean, the concept of, of ocean uh, versus negotiating, leisure and, and, and without leisure. And uh, that was regarded as a benchmark of the good life. And uh, that was only reserved for those who actually, uh, uh, who actually had land, who didn't have to do business to earn money. And uh, so this uh, uh, meticulous painting from uh, a, a Dutchman, and he was naturalized as, as, a, as, a, as an English subject and even knighted. Uh, Sir Lawrence um, Tendema, and uh, there are many of his paintings and uh, based on his research of the uh, archaeological findings. And uh, you can see the kind of depiction of uh, the leisure life 
uh, uh, in Paris style, and a bit different from the first one. The first one, as I suggested, should be more uh, more ceremonial and uh, and more vertical in, in 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 a sense. But the Vitruvius emphasized the more the kind of uh, uh, the kind of uh, influence from the street, from the public realm, and a, a vertical, a vertical relationship, but somehow with a horizontal distraction, if I may put it this way. So if we look at more uh, plans and uh, uh, Pompeii, uh, regardless, of, regardless of the sizes of the courtyards, uh, large or small, some with two atriums, and uh, a very large peristyle or uh, a very large garden at the back. And uh, it's uh, it's party, if I may use the, the French concept of, of, of this party, the essence, the pattern of uh, Roman domus, they are exactly the same, mathematically speaking. Mm. So, uh, judging from this era photograph of Pompeii, and much of its uh, urban fabric, has been preserved, of course. And uh, um, in a way, it disappeared in the European history. And uh, uh, not that uh, courts in buildings uh, no longer uh, existed after, after um, the decline of the ancient world, after the decline of the Roman Empire. No, they existed. They existed in uh, medieval times and they existed in the Renaissance. But the meaning of these courts changed. And I, I'm going to spend uh, a few more minutes to talk about that. Uh, this is something that I, uh, if I may paraphrase this cliche, the great divergence. And, uh, and when I, when I, um, uh, when I talk about China, and you will see what, what I mean. But uh, a city that is knitted together uh, uh, as a fabric of courtyards, and uh, um, somehow it did not continue in the European history. So you can see uh, the center of Pompeii, the Forum, Basilica, and markets, and the bathhouse, and then the rest of that. Is, is this what I call a carpet of the courtyard matrix? So this vertical relationship, it seems to me, and I would like to refer to it as the heavenly house, because you are uh, you are uh, separated from the civic world, D despite what Vitruvius wanted people to understand the courtyards or the obligation of those ones who are in power. Uh, still, this vertical relationship, the, the heavenly house, is uh, the essence, as far as I can see, uh, of courtyard living. And, and that, that's a sketch I've made on one of those uh, uh, reconstruction of the Pompeii houses. And that, I think, uh, is commonly shared in Roman architecture. Although the Romans admired the Greeks, and uh, to the extent that they probably did not realize how ingenious they were and how uh, inventive they were. In fact, uh, it was the Romans uh, that created the true sense of being in, in, the, in the interior, the true sense of being in the world created for the human and the human is in the middle of that. So I would like to see um, the Pantheon, you know, devoted to uh, 10,000 gods and uh, before Christianity. Uh, in a way, um, it is in essence the same as a, as a, as a Roman Domus, as a Roman atrium. It is this uh, relationship between heaven and earth. So the, the, the oculus, it's not a glassy roof and uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's a narrow uh, um, 
uh, opening to the sky and uh, to the heavens. I remember uh, in the words of uh, uh, American philosopher, dental art, uh, uh, a dental office, you know, the, the, the coffer ceiling, this splendid concrete ceiling, uh, more than 40 meters in like, di diameter. And uh, it, it becomes smaller, the coffers become smaller. And uh, in his mind's eye, it's, it's a chorus of angels uh, flying out. Anyway, uh, after the courtyard, I mentioned the, the great divergence. Uh, something interesting happened. Let, let's make the great leap forward, if I may use a Chinese uh, uh, phrase. Uh, let's 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 uh, uh, move to let us move to uh, the Renaissance straight away. Um, by using Pladio's um, country villas as, as the example. And uh, again, yesterday uh, when I was talking to Aslina and I said uh, RIBA is a fine institution. And uh, uh, just to talk about its Pladio collection and uh, that's such a wonderful institution and uh, it's a culture institution. Yeah. Um, so Pladio, I think the conventional uh, wisdom is that, uh, you know, he, um, as part of the, the whole Renaissance uh, movement, and he uh, uh, recreate a kind of a, a classical architecture. So we, we talk so much about the proportion and uh, um, the uh, classical order and the uh, 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 geometry or uh, uh, symmetrical geometry of Pladio's buildings. But I think we may be missing the point here. And uh, I think the question I would like to ask is why did uh, Pladio make a country villa, which is, uh, which is a country house for, for the Venetian and Veneto nobles to spend a leisurely summer to pursue literature away from uh, city politics and business, or to party. Why, why did Pladio make a country villa look like a, uh, a temple? So the, the very meaning of rotunda, yeah. And I think that's the first question I have to, I have to ask. But when you, when you look at, when you look into any of the uh, Pladio villas or other Renaissance villas, even Raphael's uh, fascinating design of Villa Madonna uh, at all the skirt of Rome. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm aware, I'm, I'm, I'm probably speaking to many of the English architects or English audience. Uh, so if you examine this as a, a house plan, and uh, it, it is a very cu curious one, and uh, it is probably a faulty house plan in the English mind, because the English invented something that we take for granted in the modern world. That is a privacy, that is segregation. But uh, in, in this plan, and uh, all rooms are interconnected, more so than this interconnected matrix, and that they are all lined up. You can view out windows, doors, corridors, standing in the middle and the building and I would like to I would like to imagine the building as um, as an optical device like, like a camera like, like a viewfinder yeah. so it's very horizontal but when you when you exam pay attention uh, to rotunda to to this uh, uh, domed space and you quickly re realize something changed, if we call it a grid divergence. Uh, this paramount verticality in Pladio's building, and uh, it is covered. It is covered by a lantern, and uh, it is no longer the only relationship or the only dialogue that you would you would strike. And uh, instead. Uh, 
your attention, predominantly your vision, is uh, 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 directed horizontally towards um, the outside world, the capacious world. Hence the building as, um, as a viewfinder. So this change from uh, a vertical relationship to a horizontal relationship, as far as I can see, is a, is a radical change in the European history. And then the climax of that, you would walk out, walk about in the building and walk out. And uh, the portico, uh, the, this splendid portico, monumental one, would give you a magnified, magnified command of that capacious world. So it, it was a kind of confidence, confidence that, that probably the, 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 if we talk of the modernity, modernity actually started there with this confidence. Yeah. Space and time um, is absolutely under human command. And uh, um, the, the vertical relationship is somehow neglected or not as important. Uh, from that point onwards, and that the rest is the rest is history, as well, as we all know. And the 17th century in Europe was the time when modern science uh, modern science flourished. Yeah. I, I'm uh, conscious of time, so I will have to uh, move forward quickly into the second part of the long story. Again, I will tell the long story uh, in a in a brief manner. Yeah. The Chinese courtyard. You see, uh, if we look at uh, this uh, courtyard, and uh, um, it, it, it could be a courtyard built between the 18th century through to the 19th century, and even to the middle of the 20th century, you know, what we call a Beijing quadrangle, yeah, a standard one. And uh, there are variations. Some of them, they are, they are more courts and uh, extended uh, uh, longitudinally and also extended on uh, the two parallels. Um, now, at about the same time, I, I, I think during the Qing dynasty in the uh, 18th century, um, uh, or around that time, when scholars tried to imagine um, how people actually lived in the Chinese antiquity. I mean, this scholar, Zhang Huiyan, and uh, did a kind of diagram, a bit like an architectural party. And uh, in a way, it is more or less the same as a 18th century or 19th century Chinese courtyard. It's symmetrical, and the building is uh, encircled or enclosed within a wall and uh, uh, there are two gatehouses for homeschooling and right in the middle on the axis is a stone tablet for uh, ancestor uh, comm commemoration and and then a building which is uh, 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 elevated above the ground above the lower court that opens to the court it is probably the major room uh, equivalent to the English hall, and that there are some other rooms attached to it. It is not an architectural drawing, but uh, it tells you more or less uh, the courtyard pattern in the Chinese mind. So uh, he, of course, did not know what the house was like in the Chinese antiquity. Uh, not many ancient buildings have survived in China. That's another interesting uh, um, uh, topic, uh, which is beyond today's talk. But let's look at this. Archaeological ruins, and uh, um, at approximately 500 BC, uh, Western Zhou courtyard, and uh, um, that was the time when Confucius was alive. So if you if you look at um, the configuration, the footprint of this building, and you can see it is exactly the same as the party drawn by a 17th century or 18th century Chinese scholar who used the literature 
uh, to uh, derive uh, from the literature to, to 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 derive from the literature to come up with uh, uh, with a building uh, a configuration. So you 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 see uh, uh, the building uh, is surrounded uh, uh, well built around the periphery, and there are, there are three courts and uh, gatehouses, and uh, there's a screen in front of uh, in front of the gate. Yeah. And the same cemetery and the same uh, major room elevated above the ground. Yeah. So this reconstruction by um, a uh, wonderful Chinese architecture historian, Fu Xinyan, and uh, you can see because uh, uh, the footprints are there, and uh, so the reconstruction of it is quite reliable and the only thing that you can't be 100 percent sure about reconstruction uh, is the roof shape um but it looks more or less the same as uh, 18th century 19th century or even 20th century beijing quadrangle and uh, uh, the differences are slight and uh, uh, that there's a screen in front of the building, but in the Beijing quadrangle, the screen is still there, and uh, but it's retreated into the building. So, what did Confucius talk about this building? And he was he was alive, he was active, and he was a teacher um, at that time. And also, when you look at this section, and uh, uh, in essence, it is not so much different from the Roman courtyard, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but the Chinese courtyard is more expensive. And the, the vertical relationship is there, but not as compelling or powerful as we see in a Roman domus. So according to Confucius, and there are a few things, and uh, uh, that might happen in the Chinese courtyard. He talked about the quorum. He talked about uh, how a family as a basic unit of society uh, should, uh, 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 should be operated. And he talked about, uh, after all, um, the morality and uh, how the society and politics should be governed by morality. Uh, but he was not abstract. So what would you do before you walk into a house and uh, you would pause before the screen and you would clear your thought and make sure you're properly dressed. And then you cross the threshold and uh, you are in the lower court and uh, the hall is open to the lower court. And uh, uh, so when the blind musician Mian uh, called in, and the Confucius would ask him to step up to the hall uh, uh, on the reserved uh, step that is reserved for, uh, um, for the uh, uh, respected guests, and then uh, the guest would uh, would decline, would use the other step to to step up, and then Confucius would tell him, and so and so is here, so and so is there, so they would sit down on a piece of mat. Uh, sedentary furniture was not was not invented at that time, so they sat on the floor, and uh, uh, they would uh, uh, hold a conversation, while the pupils would actually. Uh, sit in the court to listen to the conversation. Uh, but the rooms behind it, the chambers, uh, in a, one day when one of Confucius' pupils was ill and Confucius went to visit him, but he did not walk into the room. He only held his hand through the window to say, uh, you know, how, how ill is this student? And uh, he uh, uh, he was very sad, you know. Uh, when when his uh, student died, he he grieved excessively, but he didn't really show that emotion. Yeah, he was uh, he was quite different from 
Socrates, although they 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 share some uh, they share so much commonality. So, according to the Chinese learning, and uh, a courtyard is almost a metaphor for learning and also for one's uh, life journey. So stepping up to the hall is the first step. And uh, the second step is to enter the chamber. And uh, so there are, there, there, are, there, are, there are at least two stages in one's learning. Stepping up, stepping up to the hall, uh, and then entering into a chamber that would represent, that would uh, represent the supreme learning or the supreme achievement in, in life. So all these things seem to belong to the uh, uh, common characteristics of uh, uh, the Chinese society as a, as, a, as a secular society. And Confucius did not talk about heaven and the earth relationship, despite the fact that it is still a heavenly house. So when he was asked about heaven and he simply said well you know heaven does not speak why should i speak and uh, there there's there's the son of heaven so he would take care of this relationship that the, the the rest of the populace would take care of their life within the, within the courtyard and uh, so in a way and uh, uh, the heavenly business is being taken care of, and the courtyard is such a powerful metaphor. So when you when you look at this comparison between a house could be a royal residence, very large house on your left, uh, from approximately 500 BC, and a Beijing quadrangle on your right uh, that could be built uh, as late as uh, the earlier 20th century. And uh, the similarities are striking. They are remarkably similar. And uh, in terms of the architectural configuration, the party is exactly the same. Yeah, there's no difference. So the great divergence did not happen. Uh, the heavenly business has always been there, although it has never been a kind of paramount religious feeling, not as vertical. Yeah. Um, the Chinese just could not be bothered. They did not change it. When their intellectual foundation was, uh, was established, uh, at the 500 BC or around that time. And uh, if I may make another big generalization, it seems to me the Chinese have never radically changed their worldview. And uh, they build everything as a courtyard. You see, this is another uh, comparison of um, the uh, uh, courtyard in antiquity and the courtyard uh, from uh, the 18th century onwards, the Beijing courtyard. The only difference is the position of the screen and the retreated and the first one and the for you know, guests, servants and the uh, preparation of the you know, miscellaneous of life, the more ceremonial one, elder son, second son and the uh, unmarried daughters would be tucked uh, in the last courtyard. Yeah, tucked in the last courtyard. So if we may make a quick summary, and uh, um, we can see um, the difference between the Roman courtyard and Chinese courtyard seem to be slight differences or nuanced differences. But the vertical relationship is more or less the same. And the one seems to be more civic and directly open uh, uh, to the civic space. You know, uh, many years later, and more than a century later, and uh, um, uh, Palladio reinterpreted Vitruvius and he even made 
the civic obli uh, the, 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 the civic rule, the, 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 the uh, obligation, made it the obligation of those ones who are in power, so that uh, the poor, the powerless, could actually spend the time leisurely uh, in the atrium, and because it's ornate, it's beautifully made. Yeah. Uh, whereas Confucius talks talk about, you know, uh, uh, the right or the philosophy of life, the decorum, the proper behavior, and benevolence, being human. And also, he was a very humorous person, and he was never abstract. He always used the, you know, uh, the daily life uh, examples uh, to, uh, to, to um, uh, teach his students, his pupils. And none of them, none of them um, emphasized on this uh, uh, heavenly relationship. But that is the essence of, of, of uh, uh, the whole nature of courtyard building. And also that is the foundation uh, upon which uh, the great diver divergence occurred in the European history, as far as I can see. I, I'm, I'm aware I'm making vast claims here, but uh, let, let's use that as a, as a backdrop against which we can discuss um, some other related um, problems. So there is a, a variety of the courtyards in, in China and uh, regional differences and climate differences, uh, topographic differences, as you can see, the so-called fortress, the rampart in, uh, in Fujian, built by Hakka people. And uh, there are different shapes, indeed, a variety of them. And But if we examine uh, the meaning of its pattern and configuration, and it's the same one. And uh, I do not have time to uh, uh, look into the details today because I, I'm going to share a project with you which I, I have uh, embarked upon and to, to ask this question uh, about the divergence and, and whether or not there's any possibility of reconnecting. And, uh, and the Chinese, of course, built gardens attached to the courtyards. So in your uh, Confucian learning, much promoted by uh, the uh, emperors and those ones who are in power, uh, dynasty after dynasty, Confucius was made into somehow a serious and rigid example. So Confucian learning, in a way, uh, may have become a bit burden, but the gentry uh, did not buy it. So the garden often is attached to the symmetrical courtyard, and you can always sneak away from the side door into this watered garden where it is a, a microcosm of, uh, of natural landscape. But they also uh, shared the same pattern regard, regardless of the different uh, uh, varieties of, of it. So, and uh, again, let's, uh, let's skip that. Let's look at more images. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, um, if you want to uh, walk away temporarily from uh, away from your Confucian uh, obligation as uh, petty familias, uh, as a magistrate, as uh, as a father, and uh, and uh, you 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 could indulge yourself in the garden to uh, to practice calligraphy, to paint, to compose uh, uh, poems, and uh, because Chinese gentry, same as uh, those ones uh, uh, in the Renaissance. And uh, uh, they, they live the double life. On the one hand, they have the social obligation and they are officials. On the other hand, they are scholars. And I think Claudius clients more or less uh, lived a similar kind of life. So it's a, a life of uh, uh, contemplation and, uh, and the participation. And the Chinese built cities as, as courtyards, you know, gigantic courtyards. So as earlier as in the 700 uh, BC to the 5th century uh, BC, and uh, um, cities, the, the pattern of city uh, uh, was already 
uh, theorized. Uh, so it is a, a microcosm. It's a, it's a model of the Chinese universe as we as we all know it. And uh, the real built cities, despite the variations, and uh, you can see uh, it's more or less the same pattern. So the Chinese built from the cities to royal palaces, to houses, to workshops and restaurants, theaters, uh, uh, Buddhist temples and mosques and Taoist temples, all accommodated in the same spatial configuration. And this is uh, uh, the courtyard configuration. I think this extraordinary longevity of the courtyard living is something uh, that is worth lo looking into. And uh, another example I would like to use here is uh, this uh, uh, city map of Suzhou, not far away from Shanghai. And uh, uh, this uh, is a um, map engraved in a stone tablet. And uh, in Song Dynasty, 960 to uh, uh, 1279 AD, yeah. um, 1,000 years ago. And uh, there's this interesting discovery by American sinologist uh, um, uh, when he used a um, aerial photograph taken by American pilot in the 1940s um, above Suzhou. And when he compared that aerial photograph with this map that was engraved about a thousand years ago, and the, to his astonishment, he realized the canals and even the bridges and the, the buildings uh, in a time span of 1,000 years, it seems to be very little, very little was changed. And the only major change was the government building and that was recorded um, in history. So that extraordinary longevity, why, why didn't Chinese make any change? Why the kind of uh, progress in history in the European mind never occurred in China. Why the Chinese are so lazy, they just could not be bothered. I, I think that's the background of our discussion. But a larger background of this discussion, of course, is the divergence in Europe and also the religious change in Europe from the classical world, uh, the Chinese and the, 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 the Mediterranean uh, shared so much common ground from the multi-religious world to Christianity and to the uh, to the emergence of modern science, these major you know uh, benchmarks in European history, and and in in China, it's the kind of static nature when the world view and its intellectual foundation were established, were established in antiquity, and the, the Chinese have been very content very content with it. Yeah. And I think that's a, that, that, that is the background and, uh, and uh, in a generalized way of, of our today's conversation. And uh, uh, or a, a kind of conversation that is becoming increasingly difficult if we are influenced by uh, geopolitics and the rhetorics. So this matrix of courtyard houses in a way, it is very similar to what we have seen in Pompeii. And this is a slice of Suzhou. And uh, it lasts until very late in Chinese history. So when you look at this era photograph in the 1940s of Beijing, and uh, this vast sea of courtyards Knitted together, knitted together by uh, the courts and buildings, and the, right in the center is the royal palace, the so-called Forbidden City, with the splendid uh, uh, glazed 
uh, yellow roof or orange yellow roof. And uh, essentially horizontal, but every bit of that has its heavenly relationship. But heaven in the Chinese mind, in a secular society, but not materialistic, it's a secular society, but not materialistic, has been very well taken care of. And that's an interesting thing and very different from the European history. Yeah. OK, so this is a long preamble for a very modest project that I have been working on lately in the, in the past two years. I call it a quest, and uh, it is ongoing, and I'm going to show you a portion of it. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, the construction has just started. So um, its fate and destiny is still quite unknown. Um, but this is the uh, School of Design at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, the school building. And uh, so when I was appointed the dean and I was asked by the president to come up with the building and uh, that would accommodate the school. And it is not a new building and uh, we have been given a, a cluster of uh, three buildings and uh, um, which was built in 2003, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, this building was built when SARS was on. And uh, incidentally, uh, when we uh, start the construction of remodeling it, we are at a time of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, I don't know what was in the mind of, of of, of the architect when this building was first conceived. And uh, um, it is on our suburban campus. And uh, it, it is a very vast campus and buildings are all, you know, freestanding objects. And it is very green on that campus. So you can see it's symmetrical. And uh, there are three buildings in a way, uh, parallel. And uh, there is an atrium-like space between the first building and the second building. And uh, uh, there's a courtyard or uh, a backyard garden between the second building and the third one. Uh, overstructured, and also the architect made the building very open as if it was in the tropics. And of course, in Shanghai, it's bitterly cold in winter. It's horribly hot in summer because the overstructured atrium uh, is glazed with a glass roof and uh, uh, the the back garden and the, this is the window photograph it looks very bleak um, so i don't know whether or not you know in the uh, psychological substructure of of the of the of the architect whether or not uh, this was conceived uh, somehow as a series of courtyards and uh, so when I took it on, and I thought we could do a few things. And uh, uh, it was two years ago in uh, 2018, in August, I still have the date here when I, when I did, did, the, uh, did the earlier sketches. And I thought the uh, overstructured atrium between the first two buildings, and uh, we could clear we could delete many of the extraneous columns and beams, but uh, we could stitch it back with uh, with a timber structure, with engineered wood, because we 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 are beginning to question um, concrete buildings, reinforced concrete buildings, and uh, its green credentials, and also the, the 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 fatal problem of corrosion of reinforced concrete. So we wanted to make a gesture because this is going to be uh, a teaching building and students will have to spend many years in this building when they are uh, trying to become an architect, a designer, landscape architect. And then we could enclose this rather open uh, atrium and with uh, diffused light from south. But of more importance, 
we could we, we could create a, a kind of Chinese court and the Chinese hall, the lower court and the and the hall and the hall on top of the elevated platform. So th this would become a theater, a, a kind of a indoor amphitheater, and the students would spend time mingling with each other, but symbolically. And uh, uh, this is the place where uh, learning occurs. But it's symmetrical. So from the first court, you could look into the back garden and uh, this leisure garden. We could green it in a much better way. But uh, this, of course, is not a, a Chinese courtyard. It is also a civic space. It is open uh, to the campus. Everyone is welcome to walk in, and around it is actually the gallery, so where the teaching activities occur, students were, are uh, displayed. And then this cross section, and uh, we can see um, if we imagine it is a kind of courtyard where Confucius preaches his ideas to his pupils. And some would sit on top of uh, this elevated hall. So you climb up through this uh, seating arrangement. There are three of them. And you would sit uh, casually here and there. And the students, in, in the poetic way of describing uh, the nature of the school by Louis Kahn, you know, students do not know they are students, and teachers do not know they are teachers. Uh, they are all sitting under a tree in you know, a very Buddhist sort of uh, analogy, but this is a Chinese court, you know, the lower court and the hall. And one day you would step up, step up to the hall and perhaps you would enter into the chambers. So all the teaching rooms and studios are uh, uh, in the next building and then you can view into the back garden. And, and then we use this uh, 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 engineered wood structure and a very simple uh, arch four, and we would re repeat it three times to stitch back the damaged structure, and then we use the same structure to make the roof. So, as you can see from the plan, and uh, uh, after the enclosure and the, the recreation of this uh, theatrical space, and you do not actually view into uh, the court directly, and there is a screen. And then around it is the gallery, and you can see the back garden through this view corridor. And this is the amphitheater. This is also Confucius courtyard. And then there is the upper stairs, um, um, uh, uh, lecture theater, cafe, library, and etc. Yeah. So uh, this is the kind of um, space that. When I, uh, when I conceived it, I always had the Louis Kahn's exit library in my head. And uh, uh, because I read about this library before I visited it many years ago. And the Kahn, of course, was uh, hopelessly romantic. And uh, he wanted to make sure the library uh, uh, is a, a sanctuary of books and also those ones who read books. So you wanted to make sure that librarians would actually some beautiful books and have them opened and displayed on the bench. And so this is the, the, the center uh, piece of his secretary, uh, se secretary and uh, secretary. And, and then and, you know, one would uh, in darkness find a book and bring that to light, either here near the atrium or the other side near the, the reading uh, desk near the window. So I was so surprised when I visited this building some years ago and that the librarians actually still uh, continue to follow Louis Kahn's instruction. And uh, they are still doing that religiously. They have beautiful books opened and displayed uh, on the bench. And uh, the design of this arch, and uh, uh, it comes from uh, Again, uh, you know, um, the kind of uh, liver arch bridge as seen in Chinese paintings. And uh, in some uh, uh, countryside 
timber bridges and the, the same structure is still used and practiced. It's a very simple one, and uh, but it's a kind of structure that is almost like a, a space framework. So many any elements work together, and if you take away one or two elements and have them replaced or repaired, and it does not affect the structure integrity. So in a way, it is very different from the concept of uh, 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 a roof truss or uh, uh, a concrete beam, and, uh, and every structure element must work. And, uh, and uh, if one fails, the whole thing fails. So if you look at the, uh, a few more sketches and uh, further develop the one, you can see where the light should come in and how this uh, hybrid uh, court, a Chinese court, or a combination of a Confucius courtyard and the Roman courtyard is combined, and the, the civic nature and also uh, uh, the symbolism of the Chinese learning uh, is combined, and also the geometry where uh, the uh, the garden and the and the the, the, the amphitheater or the theater, uh, how these two are connected. And this is the this is the uh, more developed section. Uh, of uh, of this uh, of this building of this remodeled building, and you can see um, cross section of it, and the, the theater. Yeah. So this is the model, the section model, and uh, uh, of course you know you would not get this this sort of light, but uh, but that gives you a sense of the kind of uh, atmosphere, the ambience might you might get. I think that creates a sort of a curious feeling, but the look of it, and someone has has asked me whether or not this is a Tudor chapel, but when I explained to them, I think I said this is actually very Chinese. It's a Chinese courtyard. It's Confucius courtyard, but it also has uh, 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 the characters of a Roman domus. It's a, it's a civic space, and people have to think it twice. Um, this is a, a render to see how the wheel diffuse the light would illuminate the space. So you don't get a glare, you only get the dim the light and diffuse the light. Light has to travel uh, into this uh, into this court, and uh, this is where it should occur. This is where the uh, uh, the activities of uh, uh, students were being displayed and uh, and uh, they uh, debate about their, 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 their design and projects. Yeah. And another interesting thing is that talking about a Chinese courtyard, but on multiple levels. So when we begin to arrange the rooms around this court and also around the, the back garden uh, and uh, the leisure garden, and uh, we realize if we have the rooms uh, illuminated from outside at the lower levels, and then if we have some rooms uh, illuminated more from uh, the light coming from um, coming from the uh, 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 coming from the roof, coming from uh, the diffused light, and we would create a, a kind of ambulatory, if you like. A kind of street space around the court, so you, it created some surprises. It created a different kind of uh, uh, views. So every step forward, and the view changes. It's almost like a uh, medieval city in Europe, and uh, from the different pathways. And when you reach uh, the town square, and you get a surprise, and you get a different view. And uh, for example, you know, um, on the level of the hall or the first level, and you, you get you get the overview of this uh, of this court. But at a different levels, so viewed from the corridor, viewed from an office, viewed from the meeting room, and you you see this this civic space, this public space, from a very individual angle. So so the the ambience of the space is experienced. Uh, in a quite a different way, and uh, during the course of the day, and of course uh, in different seasons, and day and night. 
and the, the elevation and the, again and the, uh, we treated that based on this symmetrical composition and also a classic elevation and the, the, the lower levels are uh, coarse and rough and becomes thinner and also because the lower levels the, the ground level is gallery and uh, you, you only need very little light and it becomes lighter and uh, with more openings uh, but with uh, a buffer zone of corridor and uh, so the rooms do not get glare and they get diffused light um, uh, from the atrium so as you can see that composition uh, is the result of, uh, of this sort of thinking and uh, and also the building should uh, uh, should age uh, uh, should should be able to withstand aging because of the, the design of the texture and uh, and also the three levels so this is the model and as you can see uh, the, the change of the level and the, the glazing and the, the opening uh, another view of that and uh, so the building doesn't look like it's original building at all it's been completely remodeled but it's within the existing envelope and uh, i hope some of the tantalizing qualities of the spatial sequence and the and the courts and uh, in this round of remodeling and uh, and uh, our hope is to uh, uh, accentuate that. so this is what i mean by having uh, the three different kinds of textures. So imagine when uh, this building ages over the years and the, the lower levels would become darker and the suit would be stored more and uh, the textures would change. And uh, so the building will, will record the traces of time. Now, uh, I have more or less finished my long story and uh, as I tried to say at the very beginning and uh, my purpose today is not to talk about architecture per se I would like to use architecture as a vehicle and courtyard in particular to ask some questions and the question if I may put in a simple way or to simplify it, 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 it is to use this generalization that is uh, at a certain point in human history if we use the antiquity in the west and also the chinese golden time say from greek to roman times and uh, uh, in the case of chinese from 1000 BC to 500 BC when Confucius was active and alive. And uh, uh, these two cultures shared so much common ground. And uh, the kind of heavenly house we call the courtyard commonly decided or figured out way of living on earth and that was very important and at that time because my sense is that uh, at that time life on earth was full of hardship but when people raise their head to look at the sky regularity and eternity and the something that is static was absolutely irresistible and that was an important discovery that was important uh, 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 important relief of life on earth and that in turn was incre incredibly beautiful because of its regularity because of its predictability something that can be predicted seasonal change and stars and the, the heavenly arch and the heavenly dome but the, the slight differences is such that in in the chinese uh, history in chinese history you know for more than for the following 2000 years two 2000 years and the, that aesthetic nature was continued i don't know why um 
my slide. Okay, my slide is back. The static nature was was continued, and uh, although secular, the Chinese never neglected uh, this heaven and earth relationship. But in a more in a more uh, um, relaxed way, if you like. But uh, in European civilization and Christianity was a major turning point. So when many gods uh, became one god, and when, when God was uh, gradually more humanized, and the concept of heaven in the Chinese sense, and that has always been abstract and uh, 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 odorless and uh, um, uh, cannot be related to a human figure is an interesting thing. So I think we are at a time in human history, and uh, if we use building as, a, as an example, whether or not the common ground can be rediscovered and then indeed shared, and then slight differences would become uh, wonderful things in life that we can add on. So I think through this modest project, a building project, and uh, I would like to I would like to give it a go because I think striking the connection is the only way. But the striking the connection, the purpose is to identify this common ground. Uh, this is this is our shared humanity. And uh, at the same time, if we also pay attention to nuances and slight differences, maybe we can start the conversation once again, despite the political rhetorics and geopolitics. I think I should end my talk now. I have used more than an hour. OK, back to you, uh, Aslina. No, thank you, Jing. That was really, truly fascinating. Uh, and I have to say, that's the best uh, storytelling I've had the pleasure to listen to for a long time. Um, and uh, it, it is rare in the UK for us to see courtyard. I think we only see them in old buildings. Uh, cloisters in churches generally is how we resemble this. Um, and in, in, in and I live in York in Northern England. Uh, we have York Minster and we have some courtyards or cloisters, but it is rare. Uh, and I like the fact how it is perceived in Chinese culture as this uh, heavenly house because I think it does give that feeling of space, serenity um, and connection, uh, which is sometimes missing in some of the buildings we see. So thank you for that fascinating insight. I know we ran out of time, but I do have a question yeah. here. Uh, so I think we should take it because there's one question here from Yan Hui, um, who uh, he, he, it says that a very in-depth and detailed presentation about the evolution of the courtyard. Should the courtyard concept be applied to high density buildings, housing, commercial, mixed use uh, in China? And if so, how should this be realized, executed? Uh, I'm sorry, Aslina. I think the voice is uh, is not very clear to me, and uh, maybe uh, the internet connection. And uh, I wonder if you could repeat the question. Yes, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. We have the question here, just basically asking, uh, you know, just, just uh, should the courtyard concept be applied to high density buildings in China, in modern China? And if so, how should this be realized, executed? Ah, OK. Now, uh, still, uh, it's a little disjointed in the, the, the sentences, but uh, I think I get the drift of the question. And uh, the question is, uh, should the courtyard be applied to the high density situation? If so, how should we do it? Yeah. And uh, I think that's an interesting question. And uh, uh, because we tend to think high-rise buildings are the efficient way to uh, achieve high density. But uh, uh, if you recall what I uh, said at the very beginning, the discovery by Leslie Martin and his Cambridge team, 
and you will realize, you know, uh, building towers or pavilions in the middle of a piece of land is not the most efficient way. And uh, when we talk about the density, there are different concepts of density. One is uh, uh, plot ratio and space floor, uh, 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 FSR, you know, uh, uh, floor space uh, ratio. And we also talk about, you know, uh, population, population density and we also talk about the building density, and then uh, even more complex, and uh, we have perceived the density. So when something that is very dense, but it's very skillfully designed by an architect, it doesn't feel that crowded. <laughs> so I think that's a very complex uh, business, but uh, uh, I think we also understand uh, building high-rise buildings to achieve uh, high density living, there is a bit of misconception in it. And uh, I think that's a simple answer to it. But a uh, uh, courtyard living is an entirely different story. And uh, I, I think a living pattern is intrinsically linked to people's way of, li way of life. Uh, whether or not we have the most appropriate housing configuration for a way of life is the question that we architects uh, should ask. And uh, at the very beginning, when I said uh, courtyard in English connotation is probably quite alien to the English speaking world. The, the reason I say that is that the English way of living was probably slowly developed from the late 17th century onwards and very much reached the the, the sophisticated stage in the 18th century and the 19th century. So when you look at the English terrace house in Edinburgh, in Bath, and in the 19th century uh, uh, English terrace house in London, and you can see that is very different from a way of life on the continent. And that, that perfect fit between the way of living and the housing pattern is something I think that is missing in today's conversation. So when we talk about the density, we often neglect how should we live our life? <laughs> I, I guess that's probably a, a, a brief answer to it. But in terms of a full elaboration of the Chinese courtyard, uh, uh, beyond the density, as I mentioned, uh, luckily I have a book coming out by uh, Bloomsbury. So watch out. Uh, watch this space, and it should be released in London uh, in the second half of next year. Unfortunately, within one hour, I tried my best, and I, I could only <laughs> tell a brief story. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a fascinating story, and I, I'm really looking forward to the book as well. Now, thank you. That was a really, really good uh, summary of it. Uh, before I close, I wonder whether any of our audience have a question uh, for Professor Ran. If you do, please raise your hands. Uh, there's a hand button at the top if you're not used to Microsoft Teams. Seems very quiet. Uh, and I think, you know, you, you've really given us a really good overview of Courtyard. Uh, I remembered reading once, you talk, briefly touch about Palladio, actually. And I remember one of my colleagues, Charles Hind, who's the uh, RIBA chief curator, once said, a world without Andrea Palladio's legacy would be a very depressing one indeed. And I'm going to go as far as saying that a world without Courtyard and learning to appreciate this again um, would be depressing too, because it does give you a different flavor of how design and build, particularly during this pandemic where our homes have become, as you can see my son at the back occasionally, have also become our workplace and the feeling of space have become so much more important to many of us. So I just wonder, uh, as part of disclosure, and you talk about people to people connection, how do you see courtyard in the modern world as connecting people? Is it a way that we can integrate into a design to ensure that connection remains? Well, I, I think we ought to do that. We ought to do that. And uh, I think if you put Palladio and the courtyard uh, in a sort of a comparative study, 
and that's a fascinating one indeed in itself. And I briefly touched upon Pledio, and I think he and the others in the 16th century uh, represent a radical, radical change in European history. And that, that is the level of confidence, and that, that is the kind of a projection from inside to outside to capacious world. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the preamble for the emergence of modern science. And I think that sort of uh, 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 revisit of uh, uh, the uh, classic world and humanism was actually given a very different light. Uh, but that confidence, if we look at it today, and uh, my sense is that we ought to become a little bit more humble and to reflect on that confidence, because the expansion of horizon and uh, uh, space and time, and uh, as if you know, uh, there is no limit, and then. Uh, a lot of things in our life, just to use the recent COVID-19 as one example, one of many. And we are absolutely humbled. We are absolutely humbled. Whether or not our capacity, expansion, uh, economic growth, and uh, 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 the, the, the growth of our experiences, and the level of enjoyment, consumption, and even to the more abstract level, uh, human cognition, how much can we know? I think the recent events uh, uh, in, in recent history uh, probably uh, are forcing us to actually rethink about that level of the human confidence. This is the reason why I think it's timely uh, for us to revisit the antiquity both the European antiquity, the Chinese antiquity, and many other cultures, when uh, there was this common understanding of uh, uh, the limit, and uh, the limit uh, can be somehow uh, transformed or uh, turned into the form of morality. And I think these are the kind of things that are uh, probably missing in today's conversation. So I think to come back to your very direct question whether or not the courtyard would enable people to reconnect. I think in a metaphoric way, if we, uh, uh, we, we, may, we may or may not actually build actual courtyards, but uh, in a metaphoric way, architecture must, must do that. Uh, if we don't, we fail. Thank you. That is a very good way to end uh, today's talk because we do have to connect to each other and must continue to do so. I absolutely agree with you. I'm very much looking forward to visiting you in Shanghai and very much looking forward to welcoming you uh, in London next year with your book, hopefully, in September. So thank you once again, Zing, for a fantastic talk. We are humble and delighted that you've given your time today for our IBA, our audience, uh, and architecture lovers out there. Thank you so much for your time for that fascinating talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, once again, uh, this event is recorded. It will be available on our IBA YouTube channel as well uh, for the future. I want to wish all of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good uh, weekend. Do stay safe and uh, take care. And I hope it's not too early to wish those who celebrate Christmas a very happy Christmas. And we're all looking forward to a wonderful 2021, I'm sure. Uh, Professor Iran, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It thank has you. been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Likewise. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.